Hi, I'm Melissa Ray of Thrive Beauty Services. I provide transformational beauty services in salon, at home, on site, and at your convenience. I'm proud to be sponsoring Get Conscious Now. My name is Greg Relo. I'm a local attorney and mediator. I'm pleased to be associated with Get Conscious Now. I find the show inspiring. I hope you enjoy the show. Please contact me for help on all your legal matters. I look forward to it. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm Patricia DiOrio. Welcome to Get Conscious Now. Thanks a lot for tuning in today and I'd like to thank our wonderful studio audience for being here today. It's always great to have your presence here at the studio, so thanks for coming. So I'm really excited about today's show. Um, and before you meet our guest, um, I'd like to introduce Stu, who is going to uh, share with you a little bit about how you can follow us on Facebook. Stu? How did you know? Yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm Stu. I'm the co-host around here. And uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Get Conscious Now. And if you're just tuning in for the first time, uh, you can relax a little bit because there's really nothing to get. It's more a matter of being, of being conscious, becoming more awake, hopefully to a more loving state of being. And if you've missed any of our prior programs, and even in this most recent season here, we've had Paul Selig, uh, best-selling author of I Am The Word, as well as Gay and Katie Hendricks about conscious relationship. Come visit us on our YouTube channel or on Facebook where you can watch the shows in their entirety if you've missed any of them because they're informative and entertaining. And uh, this program is really going to be a great one, so stay tuned. Stay tuned for all of it. So Patricia, Patricia why don't you introduce our guest? I will. Yeah. So our special guest today is going to take us into the world of neuroscience. And you know, neuroscience has always been a key part of the medical world, obviously. Um, but in recent decades, especially with the onset of the concept of neuroplasticity of our brain, it's been seeping into mainstream society. And we're discovering through neuroplasticity that the brain is malleable, that we can change the brain, that we can heal the brain. So how does this happen? How does this come about? How, does the, how is the brain healed? Well, we're fortunate to have with us today a man with the answers. He is Marty Wutke, who is an expert in neurotherapy. He is a neurobiofeedback specialist and the founder of the Wutke Brain Institute, which we're fortunate to have right here in Santa Barbara, California. Marty, so wonderful to have you, you with us thank today. You. Thank you for thank inviting you for me. Being here. Yeah, welcome, Thanks, Marty. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you have a really interesting background and in how you got involved in this, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd love to hear about it. If you can just kind of give us the cliff notes of okay. how, what motivated you and inspired you to do this work. Sure, sure, cliff notes. So um, uh, I'm from New York, and in my adolescence, I went through a significant period of drug use um, and got addicted uh, to some hardcore type drugs and went through the traditional treatment route um, up until I was about 21 years old, which was 1978. Finally, what happened was, and um, this isn't unique to me, this is uh, sort of the well-known process that can occur in a person's life who is uh, involved in, in drug addiction and trying to get out. So I had a spiritual awakening experience. And, um, can you share what that was? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, I had hit bottom, uh, and my father had passed away. So I was at a very um, critical point in my life. and. Uh, I ended up at a sister's house, and you know, people have asked me many times, obviously, to try to describe what happened, but it was, uh, it was surrender. I knew this was it, and I wasn't going to live a lot longer if something didn't happen. So I, um, and I was, I was sort of homeless at that point, too, so I was uh, at my sister's house. I went to bed that night, uh, it was October 28th, and um, the next morning I woke up uh, with the experience of, uh, the best I can describe was I became aware that there is something that is a divine presence. And it, um, it, you know, it saturated my being. And I thought I had a drug flashback, to be honest with you. I thought I'd sort of gone crazy because mm -hmm. there was a vision involved, too. And what happened was after that, I could not, I couldn't shake it. 
it was always there. I always became aware, you know, that, that this presence was always there, always with me, you, everyone, everybody, everywhere, it's everything. And then I, I spent uh, really the, the, the rest of my younger days trying to figure out what that was and then how I could facilitate that with other people. What is the spiritual awakening process? And um, within a matter of a few years, I was uh, working in a psychiatric hospital in Georgia, sort of cutting off a lot of time here, but it was a drug, drug and alcohol treatment center, chemical dependency, head injury. We had an uh, adolescent unit, and there was depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. So my primary intention working there, and the medical director realized this, was that I, was, I had become a hardcore meditator by that point. And my, my belief was that meditation does something to change the brain, and that's really what had happened to me. And it also sets the stage for this thing we call spiritual awakening. But I realized working in, in this mainstream medicine that I had to bring validity to the meditation process. And this was back in the early 80s. There was some research mm -hmm. out, but it wasn't um, you know, all that uh, you know, obvious that meditation really and truly was changing the brain. So I realized that the secret and the key to meditation was in the brain, that enlightenment and awakening doesn't happen out here somewhere, like it's some metaphysical thing. It happens in the brain and nervous system. Mm -hmm. And there is a transformational process that has to happen in order to set, sort of set the groundwork for this awakening process to occur. So I started using brainwave biofeedback, which is a type of biofeedback, just taking brain activity, feeding it back to the individual. And uh, very quickly, we, the results were rather astounding. And what, what happened was, the same thing you see with meditation, is that the side effects of sort of training the brain to optimize its own function, the side effects just happened to be, you know, uh, remission of anxiety, depression, anxiety disorders, less craving for drug and alcohol, and that's how neurofeedback sort of started to snowball because it was like, well, this isn't just for waking people up. It's also a, a way to approach all these other problems and issues. So I worked there for 12 years and um, treated many, many thousands of clients and then went off on my own, opened up centers in Atlanta and then in, in uh, Netherlands and then moved here about six years ago. Where did you study to... Uh... Well, that's the thing. There, there wasn't... Well, you go to workshops. I went to Menninger's, studied there for a while. There, there really isn't any place yet where you can go to school and learn no feedback. Now, Baylor, I believe in Texas, has started a program. And I, and I think it won't be long before other schools start the program. Right. So I was really one of the initial people in the field who was just starting to put it all together. And there was, a, you know, half a dozen of us out there doing the same thing at the same time. Mm. So what, it was a spiritual motivation. Excuse me, Stuart. Absolutely. It, and, it, and, it can, you know, and, the, and the truth is, I, it continues to be because... My experience is that when, and it, and it doesn't have to be this huge epiphany either, but when, when any individual begins to sort of get that sense of, of what's really happening inside them, that there's a spiritual being inside that body, and it's that spiritual being which is their connection with in the 12-step in the programs we call the higher power. But once a person learns how to access and experience and tap into that, Everything changes. So, you know, in my work, I don't sit there when a client comes in and say, oh, well, you're here for your migraines, but what I'm really going to give you is spiritual waking. I don't do that. <laughs> I, I just, I, you know, you, you just maintain that space, and that's always your center. And then no matter what somebody comes for, whether it's attention deficit disorder or migraine headaches, that space does something when you hold that space. I know you, you know that. I mean, that's what this, this whole thing is about. When you hold the space of consciousness, that is going to resonate with whoever you're working with. And then when you use a process like we do of neurofeedback where the person's consciousness is opening, I mean, you're giving the person feedback of the electrical activity in their brain. That's consciousness. It's also the reflection of all the neurotransmitters. And so when you give that feedback, there's this self-reset process that begins to happen. And you, again, you see uh, all of the what I call all of the layers of junk that are over that person's soul start to be removed so that soul can finally start to shine. So. Well, it definitely sounds like beautiful work. 
Yeah. And so let's clarify a little bit for people sure. what exactly neurofeedback is. Okay. So most people are familiar with biofeedback. Biofeedback is very simple. You can take any biological function, uh, heartbeat, skin temperature, perspiration, muscle tension. So you take the biological mechanism, and if you can give feedback to the individual, whether it be visual, auditory, or tactile, uh, it's just a matter of time before you can learn to control it. It's operant conditioning. You can do it just by feeling your heartbeat. And sit there long enough, you can slow it down. So neurofeedback is sort of a, a leap uh, where we are literally measuring the brain, measuring the EEG activity, the electrical activity off of the scalp. It's non-invasive, nothing goes in, just simply listening to what the brain's doing. And there's massive amounts of research now that enables us to look at that activity and say, oh, this is potentially a problem, this is potentially a problem, this could potentially be a problem, and so on. Down to little areas in the brain, we can identify all kinds of, of symptomatic uh, issues. So we identify that, and then we, we use this process, very simple, again, operant conditioning, where we measure the person's brainwave activity. We know that there's a certain activity that needs to shift in one direction or the other, and then we give the person feedback just to reinforce that when that shift is occurring. It's operant conditioning. It's, it's sort of in this new realm of BCI, brain-computer interface. This is happening now, where there's paraplegics running wheelchairs with their EEGs, with their brain waves. So this is not sci-fi anymore. We just have to use it therapeutically. Um, and it's all about optimizing brain function. It's not about treating diseases or disorders. Mm -hmm. we, know that we, can, we know what optimal brain function is. So we use this feedback technique to reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are the, uh, the, the technological syst systems that are used to determine what's going on in the brain? Um, well, you, you, we have to use an EEG, uh, EEG amplifier. An EEG amplifier literally um, listens to the brain, um, amplifies the EEG activity by 34,000 times and then it goes into the computer software, analyzes it, it's compared to a database, and then we use that database to determine where a person's particular EEG is on the bell curve. So if some, somebody may have outlier activity, often you'll see that with head injury and other types of um, you know, pretty significant issues. But the goal is to bring the activity into the optimal range. When it's in the optimal range, the neurotransmitters are working better, the neuro neuroendocrine system is working better, a whole host of sort of down, down the pike activity starts to normalize and straighten out. Mm -hmm. um, do, are most of the brain scans, that do you see people's, people in a normal range most of the time or? Um, most well, everybody has something out somewhere. We measure many thousands of metrics. So it's actually pretty rare to see somebody in, you know, in the normal range. Um, you'll usually find little places, little parts, something that isn't quite cooperating with the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about brain waves, and again, I, I've said this, but I want to emphasize this, it reflects the brain chemistry. The activity, the electrical activity that we pick up is a result of the neurotransmitters, the excitatory and the inhibitory. So this is a way to actually shift that because you're, you're using a feedback loop and you're saying to the brain, ah, there's too much excitatory neurotransmitters. That's why you're having this type A behavior. That's why you're freaking out. That's why you're having these problems. So let's, let's intervene this way and sort of get around and quiet that activity down. Okay. Yeah. I'm really curious, are all brains kind of mapped the same way with certain pathways would indicate that they're connection, connected that certain pathways would indicate some form of uh, either neurosis or limiting belief patterns, and that there are certain other pathways that are perhaps a little more expansive, a little more connected, a little more connecting with others and more socially. Uh, sure, there's even yeah. research on leadership showing that there's a different pattern in people who have a high degree of leadership. We, we're, we really have mapped out an enormous amount of data now. Um, and you, but you have to remember, too, that the brain has three levels. It has a very primitive level, and then a little less primitive, and then what we call the neocortex, which is supposed to be a rational thinking brain. What we see, for the most part, is that the, the limbic system, which is sort of the midbrain, the mammalian brain, the emotional brain, fight or flight, 
uh, tends to be overactive in most people. It has to do with survival, with um, protection, with competition, and with territoriality, which is sort of a reflection of what's happening in the world now. It's these primitive drives that are sort of keeping things going, politics and, and wars and so on. So in the individual, we look at that too. Is this limbic system running the show here? We have, uh, we often say that the limbic system, this lower part of the brain is holding the rational cortex hostage. Hmm. And you know, and then people are trying to change their lives, they're trying to move forward, but there's something down there that's not letting them, survival instincts, fears, anxieties, and so on. So much of what we do is looking at those pathways and those networks. And, and working to quiet and calm that limbic drive down. When you do that, then the cortex can finally work right. The brain's CEO, you know, the rational brain that says it's not a good idea to have nuclear weapons all over this planet. Hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what's doing that? The limbic system. So getting that part of the brain to take over again is really one of, the, one of my personal missions. Well, I, I like to, this is a good time for me to share my personal experience and I appreciate your, you know, giving me your opinion on it now. So I had a brain scan. Uh, Marty offered me a brain scan this past week and I was really delighted um, to have it because I always want to know what's going on in my brain. Anyway. We all do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had a brain scan and he, you know, he put this goop on my head and the, and the cap and and uh, all the appropriate mechanisms there. And I, I guess I, I fell within normal mm -hmm. for the most part, but then I had these two red, like silver dollar size spots in my brain behind my ears. And Marty asked me, you know, do, do you have, did you have a concussion or any kind of, dam uh, uh, I think it was a concussion mm -hmm. or any, Head accident or head injury, yeah. And I haven't, not to my recollection, I hadn't. And then he said, well, what about trauma? And it was interesting because before that, I was hooked up and I mm -hmm. mentioned the molestation at seven and apparently the, mm -hmm. my EEG mm -hmm. responded to that pretty, mm -hmm. pretty dramatically. So um, I had had a molestation at seven that was very, very uh, profound in that at seven years old, I had an orgasm, and I was a good little Catholic girl. So those two things were like completely... Incongruous. In, <laughs> that's right, yes. yeah, right. So um, what you said was that it was still in my limbic brain, mm -hmm. and that's why these two red marks I still had mm -hmm. that showed up on my brain scan. Mm -hmm. So how does one shift those? I guess what I want to do now is what, was, what are the exercises, the designs, the modalities, or the, mm -hmm. the games that you, that you play with the computer that would change that? Well, the, we can use any type of game and any type of modality because it's just a feedback process. We, we measure the activity, the computer analyzes it, and then starts to give your brain sort of permission to, to begin to lower that activity to begin to quiet it down. Because any type of post-traumatic stress doesn't just turn off by itself. I mean, you, I mean, look at the thousands of, of uh, veterans coming back from the military. Mm -hmm. right. It doesn't turn off just because you've crossed the ocean and are back home safe. The brain doesn't know that. So it keeps up these protective patterns and that's part of the problem. That's why cognitive therapies are not highly successful with post-traumatic stress disorder because it's deeper levels of the brain that are, are providing protection and survival. And no matter what you can sort of cognitively say, these parts of your brain say, uh-uh, it's not safe out here. I found out when I was seven years old. I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna keep this system protected. So it's all about survival and protection. And that's what this approach is, allowing the brain to begin to reduce and, and hopefully finally eliminate these protective mm -hmm. patterns. Well, I was kind of stunned when that showed up because I've done, as you can imagine, once I discovered what had happened to me because I had suppressed it for many, many years, over 30 years, um, just with PTSD behavior, tr trichotillomania was the mm -hmm. behavior that I had, mm -hmm. which is pulling out of all the eyelashes and eyebrows. So it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I even discovered what happened to me, and then I started to work on it, and I did every kind of therapy and modality you can think of, including you know all kind of cognitive mm -hmm. work. Um, 
So I, I've been feeling like I've been hot on the trail of healing mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. it shows up in ways in my life that don't work. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a real blessing that I was able to have this brain scan because mm -hmm. now, now it's brought to my attention and I can really work on shifting it. Yeah. So yeah. I want to thank you for You're that. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for Good. coming. So now can uh, this neurofeedback work for all kinds of early age traumas as well as any other kind of, uh, I'll just say limiting beliefs and, and even for people who are otherwise highly functional but have issues that prevent them either in relationship or mm -hmm. uh, finances, what have you? Yeah, I mean, these behaviors and patterns, again, don't happen out there somewhere. It's not all just in the mind. There are pathways in the brain that are supporting them. And, you know, our work is vicarious. We, we, we don't talk, well, we do talk about the behaviors and what are the limiting beliefs and patterns of whatever is going on. But we, we correlate that, that sim, those symptomologies with the EEG and with those pathways. And then we just try to optimize and normalize those pathways. And what will happen, in, and I'm going to quote the title of a book by Daniel Amen, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. It was written several years ago. This is a very mm -hmm. good book. Daniel Amen, famous guy, has been on NPR quite, uh, quite often. But it, it really is that simple. If you can get the brain to shift, your whole life is going to shift because your brain is what's running everything all your behaviors, all your beliefs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, and then there's people who have to go through these shifts, and we, we're shifting their brains, and they need counseling, they need uh, therapy, um, and many other uh, types of, of work, potentially body work and so on. So we, w w this is not just a silver bullet. We just don't go in and cure people. It's not like that at all. We... We'll, we create plasticity in the brain. We start to shift patterns so that they function, the function is better, but then somebody has to go in there as well to help that shift move in the right direction. It's a very important like process. Like a therapist or Like or a therapist or a counselor, a psychologist, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you actually are stimulating new areas or different areas within the brain to help to create these new pathways that are a little kind of reshaping, remolding yes. with the plasticity? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there, I can give you thousands of examples, but um, there's, there's a recent book, very good book, by Bessel van der Kolk. He's a, a medical uh, professor. The, I highly recommend the book. It's called um, The Body Keeps the Score. It's all about trauma, developmental trauma, and what it does to the brain, how it interrupts stages of development, how it, th it can throw a whole person's life off, you know, from something that happened three or four or five years old, or even in the womb. So, uh, Vernikov is, is quite an expert, and there's an entire chapter on neurofeedback in there. He thinks it's going to be the next biggest uh, movement. There's about 9,000 studies out now. People are still sort of learning about this, but and, and probably, I would estimate, 20,000 practitioners around the world now. Which is not very many. No, mm -hmm. relatively mm -hmm. speaking, it's not. But my, my prediction is that in a few years, uh, neurofeedback practitioners will be just as common as occupational therapists or physical mm -hmm. therapists. I really think that. <clears throat> I love the metaphor that you use that, um, and it's not, well, it's not a silver bullet. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen right away. Mm -hmm. But it's like when we go to the gym to work our bodies out, we can't go one time. Right. You know, we can't even go just maybe five or ten times. We've sure. got to consistently go. That whole slight edge principle is consistently yes. going several times a week, yes. you know, until our, our bodies reach that place where we can maintain it much easier. Yes, right? absolutely. So the, so the brain work is like going to the brain gym in it, a way. It, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. And... You know, you have to think about these patterns, just yeah. like a, um, you know, a trail through a pasture gets worn out by the cows walking along the same route. The same thing happens with the brain. Many of us have what we call pathologically stable patterns that we've had for a long time. So to teach the brain to stop doing that can, can take a little while. As you said, it's not just one shot at the gym. Right. So, um, you know, many, some people can take a number of sessions to get the brain to shift out of those patterns. It just depends and relative to the individual. So the sessions are not talk sessions. They're se sessions where people are wired up in front of a computer. Exactly. And they're playing some type of a game yeah. that's going to help to, to heal that part of the brain. Yeah, shape, shaping the brain is shaping what we like to brain. call it. And moving it towards 
um, the, the normal range in the bell curve. Normal range mm -hmm. in the bell. Z-score training, we call it. When was it that neuroplasticity actually came about? Because I know we've been hearing about it, mm -hmm. you know, in, in maybe the last two decades, but uh, it's been around a long time. It's been around a long time. The concept of neuroplasticity. Yeah, I mean, I, I know ancient yoga texts where uh, the, the, the uh, yoga teachers were saying that through your intention, you can alter your brain and change the way it works. It's become more and more accepted now in mainstream probably the last few decades. Um, I mean, neuroplasticity is a fact. Right now, we all are engaging in neuroplasticity. Every time you learn something new, remember somebody's name, your brain is sprouting and making little connections. I mean, this is a constant. Mm -hmm. um, the older we get, the less we have, but it, it, is, it is an ongoing process. It never mm -hmm. stops. And that's why it's so good for us to do things that are new, like learning to yes. dance. Yes. Dancing is a wonderful way mm. to build new neuronal pathways Absolutely. in the brain. Or doing some type of, I know you do Sudoku. Sudo, Sudoku? So, so Sudoku, yeah. Sudoku and I, I even try to do things with my non-dominant hand, yes. just to kind of mix it up sure. a little bit. Right. No, right. The, the, it sounds cliche, but if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. And it's absolutely true with brain pathways. If you don't keep those pathways intact, your brain is going to say, I don't need this part. Right. I'm going to just dissolve this pathway and let it go. So yeah, mine's already done it. that with calculus, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I can't ever remember. Yeah. I got an A in it 50 years ago or whatever. So what are some easy things that we can do in the world? I mean, if you weren't doing this, you know, this very formal work with you, mm -hmm. but we knew that we wanted to really build new neuronal pathways in the brain. What are some things that we could do aside from dancing? And well, meditation is self-directed neuroplasticity. Really? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. When you meditate and you have some kind of a contemplative practice or a focus practice, compassion, healing. That's, that's self-directed neuroplasticity. Yeah. That oh, changes the whole system. Yeah. <laughs> um, exercise is number two. Exercise. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we, it's just, it's not even a, a, a conversation anymore. The older we get, the more we need to exercise. Oxygenation, blood flow, these are critical, crucial and aside from what exercise does to the, the, the chemistry of the bloodstream, this is just, this is a given now. Um, any exercise physiologist is just like, everybody has to exercise past, you know, 40 years old. That's just the way it's going to be if you want to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. So the, I, if I was to, you know, pass this on, it would be meditation and exercise. Maybe meditation. Yeah. What about the, the uh, program called Lumosity? Are you familiar yeah, with that? Yeah. And How effective are those programs? Well, there's some controversy around them. There's been some studies done. Oh, they don't do anything. But you know, any it, it just just goes back to what we've been saying. Any kind of brain exercise is good. Um, anything that challenges your mind is good. Read, do puzzles, Sudoku, you know, whatever, dance. Um, the the physical, you know, when you, for instance, a child does not learn to move. A child moves to learn. That's, that's what we know is really happening. It's mm -hmm. all about their brain. It's not really about what their body's doing. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with us. Mm -hmm. Movement is powerful. It is affecting the brain, the way the brain functions. So, so incorporating that in your life, and these games are, are good too. Um, anything that's going to stimulate is going gonna, is gonna to get the brain I going. I was going to ask about diet for a moment, just because oh, yeah. diet is always seems to be one of these key Parts, parts to our formula here. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, a clean diet, as eliminating as much processed food as possible, um, you know, because the, the nutrients that are really important for the brain um, are critical. And if the system is not clean, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of leaky gut syndrome, right? This is the big, uh, you know, thing now. If there's leaky gut syndrome, which means there's inflammation in the intestinal wall and there's hyperpermeability, if there's that happening, there's also leaky brain. So the junk not only gets into the bloodstream, but it get, crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets into the brain. So it's really critical to keep clean and you know, keep a diet, again, as, as uh, organic and whole as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, meat eating should probably be kept to a minimum. minimum. And this is just as a result of the studies, nothing, no moral judgments there. Um, and then obviously alcohol and tobacco and all the, the things sugar. we eat. Sugar. Oh my oh, gosh, sugar, sugar is the killer. Sugar is a big baddie sugar with everything, is yeah. isn't it? Really, my God. It's not a good thing. It, we're all addicted to it, unfortunately. Well, because it is addictive. But sugar, yeah, yeah I, I would, see, I, I kind of assume people know that sugar is the yeah. number one 
substance to go when I when I talk to somebody. Get rid of the sugar. Get rid of the it's sugar, just but not, not through fruit and, and things. No, like that. fructose in the fruit and the uh, some of the cofactors help the glycemic index stay uh, fairly stable. But it's the it's the high content sugar foods that throw the glycemic index off. Uh, mess around with insulin levels, and then you're in trouble. I mean, they're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes now. Really? Mm. Yeah, and so, well, okay, so maybe we should pay attention to the sugar consumption here in the United States. I remember um, when I was investigating Lumosity, you know, checking it out, mm -hmm. that they did a study with an, an eight-year-old that were doing these programs as far as how quickly his brain was able to figure out mm -hmm. whatever puzzle it was. And they had an 87-year-old fellow doing the same thing just to compare it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that much time before really? the 87-year-old's brain was just it's as sharp up. as the eight-year-old's sure. brain. I mean, that just blew my mind. Well, that's neuroplasticity. Yeah, you that's neuroplasticity. No matter how old you are. Yeah. yeah so age matter. is simply not a factor. Nah. Right. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's encouraging to hear. <laughs> so we can teach these old dogs some new tricks, there including, you our, go. including right. myself for that matter. You know, I'm really kind of curious how we can, uh, or can this neurofeedback be used to, you talk about optimization of brain function. Mm -hmm. Can that be used for people who are already at, like say athletics, dancers, artists, people who are active with their bodies? or even stockbrokers or traders or whatever. Yeah, there's a whole peak performance moving yeah. uh, happening now. The entire Italian soccer team did this when, when they won the Gold Cup. They spent $10 million and had a mind media room and they all did neurofeedback. Really? This is, this is huh. there's something called the focus band, which your audience can Google, that we're involved with a project with them. It's for athletes. Puts them in the zone. Everybody wants to find what the zone is, the flow. Sure. Well, we know what it is. It's Naturally. an EEG pattern. Ah. Mm. So we can actually teach somebody how to get in that zone and then how to use that state for whatever their particular function is, whether it's a stockbroker on Wall Street or an athlete or a business leader or you know just somebody trying to be better at whatever is they're doing. So. It, this is happening now, and again, it's called it's focus. It's a band, you put it right yeah, on your a, head? It's an EEG, a portable EEG, Bluetooth, and it, it's an app that's on your phone. Oh, really? Yeah, this, was, this is going to be phenomenal. Oh. <laughs> so, so the exercises and practices that somebody would do uh, are basically across the board the same, no matter what? Uh, no, no. Uh, what work? I've recently done working with the company is created an algorithm to individualize protocols cause, because there's no one size fits all. Okay. We all have different brains. So we've developed an, uh, um, uh, an application that does a quick test on the individual, measures their EEG, and identifies what particular pattern, individual pattern, that person has and fits it into one of several categories. From there, the appropriate training is chosen. And um, now, you know, there's some people who need to go to an office or a clinic or a professional, but so this is more for, for general public work. But this is, this is really very powerful stuff. This is going to enable um, something that is primarily used in, in offices and very expensive. It's going to enable the general population to have more access to this. And I would think that peak performance in and of itself, I mean, aside from all the other things that are, could be healed by neural feedback, but peak performance could be a, a, a person could make their could quite have quite a fabulous career just with helping people with peak performance because you Absolutely. have, you know, just being able to be happy in life, yeah. you know, and, 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 and have your day flow and be in the flow, as they say. The, the, the problem is the limbic system again, what I, what I mentioned earlier. Every athlete, um, everybody you know who has some kind of performance orientation will tell you when that anxiety finally quiets down and they're finally present because the opposite of being present is worrying about the past and worrying about the future. future. When you're present, you're in the flow. And that's an right. EEG pattern. You're yeah. you're there, and you're not worrying. And that's and what is what the, what is the brainwave alpha? There's several different patterns that we I see. I think it would be helpful, especially if our audience is not really clear on what all the different brain waves are. Mm -hmm. Share about the brain waves, beginning with delta. Um, delta is the slowest brain wave. Um, it is uh, zero to four hertz, or cycles per second. And generally, you see delta in deep sleep states, stage four sleep. Um, you may also see it in metabolic disorders and sometimes in certain types of head injury, trauma. The next brainwave is called theta, it's four to eight hertz. It's a little faster, it's another 
sort of uh, hypnagogic state, like when you're falling asleep. It also is, um, there's a good and a bad to it, uh, theta, it can be the culprit in a lot of disorders, like attention deficit disorder. Uh, dissociative disorders tend to have a high, and, and, and you can see it in somebody's eyes, they're not there, they're in theta. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, you'll also see that too. It's, it's, um, it can be a hyper-aware state. Um, but theta can also be a, 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 the, the state where creativity and what Swami Rama, a very famous uh, person they did a lot of experiments on, he said the theta was the gateway to the infinite library within. Wow. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's, Jung talked about it, it's the, it's the collective unconscious, and, and there's a lot of information in there. I mean, the, you know, this goes to that, uh, that phrase, all knowledge is within you. Um, so theta is sort of the access point for that. And we will use it therapeutically for different types of uh, problems and for creativity as well. And is the alpha state, and most people know what alpha is, that's 8 to 12 cycles per second. And that's generally the mind quieting and, and the brain going into neutral. Um, it's useful for something. It's not useful, though, to be an alpha while you're trying to do calculus, right. Right. which we call a learning disability. Or driving your car. <laughs> or driving well, your of car. Of course, I don't know. I heard that, that, that you sometimes do go into an alpha state if you're going on a long trip. And yeah, sure. You go into what we call the default mode. The autopilot comes on, and you're sure. driving down the road, and you're at exit 12, and then all of a sudden you're at exit 85, and I go, what happened to those other <laughs> exits in between? <laughs> That's, that's the uh, default right. mode. Not a very good state to walk around in, but it, it conserves energy. Um, then there's another rhythm beyond that called sensory motor rhythm, which is anti-seizure. It's used for seizure disorders and epilepsy. It's a very powerful um, uh, frequency in that the, the whole uh, sensory motor system quiets down and it inhibits seizure activity. We use that quite a bit for a variety of disorders. Above that, it we call beta. Um, beta is from roughly 15 hertz up to 32. And that uh, the lower the beta is, the more focused you are. But when that beta moves up past 22 or 23, then we have anxiety, stress. You see post-traumatic stress disorder often falls in that range. Yeah. An interesting thing happens, though, above 32 hertz up to about 40 and a little bit beyond, it's called gamma. And gamma is a very fast wave activity. And um, what some research has shown now is that uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist meditators and uh, some yogis, in particular a type of yoga called Kriya Yoga, that uh, when these people are measured, they have a massive amount of gamma activity. Gamma is a binding frequency. When you recognize something, when you have an aha moment, your brain binds. It goes like a pinball machine, and everything is put together. It's also very present. So you'll see this in people who are advanced meditators, that, that they're in this actually charged up state. Their cortex is ringing in gamma. And mm -hmm. they're always present, they're always aware, everything's always new. The problem with gamma, though, is that it is um, irrespective of um, what's going on in that person's brain, or impartial, I should say. And, and what I mean by that is, it is gamma is a magnifier. It magnifies what's in there, what's in our mind and body. So that means it's going to... The, the flowers are going to grow, but guess what? Double-edged sword. Double-edged sword. Those weeds are going to grow, too. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's, you'll see that some people who meditate, and then you, of course, see the scandals with Doesn't very, intention have a lot to do with determining whether it's a flower or a weed? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends how it's affecting your life. Um, I mean, if, if there's, if there, what I mean by the weeds, if there's tendencies towards anger, tendencies toward unethical behavior, tendencies towards um, different types of, you know, I don't want to call them moral characteristics, but maybe ethical characteristics, then those are going to get magnified too. And so you've got to clean that stuff up. Some people call that lower chakra stuff. But before you can really experience those, those really higher, more profound states, you've got to take care of the stuff that's underneath it. Is that limbic system It's limbic, limbic and below. And below. Yeah. Yeah. And below. Bruce Lipton, who's one of my favorite uh, authors, a He's cellular great. biologist, you know, he says that from the time we're six months in utero until age six, that we're in that most programmable state of consciousness yes. where we're just like a little psychic sponge and everything that happens in our lives yep. just goes right in to the subconscious as truth. Yes. And of course, that's where we get you know, a lot of very negative programming yeah. depending on how we were raised, by mm -hmm. whom we were raised, what the mores mm -hmm. were at the time mm -hmm. and all. Um, but he says that, that even after age six that, we're, that, we, that young children spend a lot, of bit of, a lot of time in theta. Yeah. 
uh, like till a, almost until prepubescence. Is that well, how the, you see that? Yeah, there's something called a dominant background frequency in the EEG. And as, as a child, it, they do happen to be in, in low frequency, dominant frequencies uh, before seven years old. But as they get a little older, that dominant frequency moves out of the theta range, which is four to eight hertz, and starts to move up to eight hertz, nine hertz, which is alpha, and then finally the average dominant frequency in the adult EEG is 10 hertz alpha. That's where we should all be. That's when the brain is functioning at its most optimal level. But up until that point, yeah, the theta tends to be sort of hanging out up until, mm -hmm. up until seven years old usually. Mm -hmm. By pubescence, though, it should be 10 hertz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know we're talking a lot about the brain here. Mm -hmm. Let's incorporate that to the rest of the body. Sure. And nervous system, for example, yeah. which is kind of how we're feeling from mm -hmm. moment to moment. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the relationship here between at once you're starting to go into the neural feed, neurofeedback system, start to stimulate new aspects of the brain, or maybe start to help to mold new pathways, what is the feeling in the body? Mm. What does it feel like? Okay. Well, you know, as you, as you um, work with the brain, and it, it actually depends on what the brain you're working with is, is having happen, um, but as you begin to quiet the brain down, the sensory input and motor output begins to quiet down as well. And to use an example, like autistic children who have a hypo and hypersensory characteristics, so hypersensitive to tactile things, uh, hyposensitive to pain and so on, which is in the body. Mm -hmm. But as we train the brain, the brain starts processing that information differently. There's also chronic pain as well. Chronic pain, you can see it in different parts of the brain that are actually hyper-reacting. So when you train the brain, you're affecting the whole body. The nervous system is just an extension of the brain. I mean, and, mm -hmm. the, and so is your abdominal brain, the solar plexus. It is just another extension of your head brain. In fact, in many cases, it's more dominant, especially when we're, when we're uh, um, uh, in, uter in utero. So training, there's really, this, there's really a very slight degree of separation when you talk about what's happening up here is also happening down there. You know, Julia Lovins, we've had her on the show a couple of times. Yeah. She wrote a book called It Takes Guts to Be Happy. Mm -hmm. And she made the correlation between our digestion and our brain. And, and it's, it's critically important for us to have excellent digestion in order to have Absolutely. our brain functioning properly. Absolutely. You know, and then the whole GI tract, I mean, 90% of the serotonin receptors are in your gut, mm -hmm. wow. not your head. Wow. So you've really yeah. got to pay attention. So I, I'm really excited about this project that you're working on here mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara County where you're working with parolees. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. Well, uh, we've been uh, pushing this for about three years now. A, a local philanthropist um, had the idea because of some research he did about me and neurofeedback that we could reduce recidivism the recidivism rate among parolees it, it averages about 65 percent. You know, in other words, in about a year or two, 65 percent of parolees will end up back in prison. Costs the state a lot of money. 65 percent is high. Yeah, it's yeah. high, and I think it's 55 to 65 thousand dollars a year. So there has been other studies showing that neurofeedback. Um, in fact, it's sort of linear. The more the more sessions of neurofeedback uh, the um, the inmates had the lower the recidivism rate. It actually did a mm -hmm. linear crossover. Wow. Um, so we, wanna s we are getting ready to launch a project here with a local uh, um, a group called Community Solutions, who is sort of a halfway house program for, uh, for um, parolees as they come out of jail and start to integrate back into society. So what we want to do is intervene at that level and see if we can stem off the proverbial 64, 65% uh, recidivism rate. So that would be working with each parolee to determine exactly what's going on in their brain and, right. and what would be used to, to help them heal it. Yep. Change the brain, change the life. Change the brain, change the life. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds to me like you, you can do a lot of brain changing, <laughs> right? Yep. And are there any ethical issues that people should be concerned about if somebody is like, okay, I want to change your brain and Turn it this way a little bit. Well, th this is non-invasive, so you're not, you can't force the brain to do something that, is, that it doesn't want to do, you know, unless you hit them over the head. So this is non-invasive, it's purely a feedback modality. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, it, it, the brain has an interesting reset. If you just give it the right information, it's going to reset. If you give it the wrong information, it's, it's not going to do anything with it. Yeah. So, so those would be, you know, the only ethical concerns I would have is if there's invasive things happening. Mm. Because there's, there's a lot of devices out there that, that do things to the brain. Um, what would be an example of an invasive thing? Well, there, you know, there's a lot of audiovisual entrainment out now. It's quite popular. Um, it kind of comes and goes, and that's where you wear these goggles and headphones and lights flash and sounds beep. Well, again, everybody's brain is different. There's no one-size-fits-all model. So those kind of things, like right now, these lights are flashing. We just can't see it um, if, they're, if they're the type of lights I think they are. Uh, fluorescent lights flash 120 times a second. That's why some people are so disturbed by it. You yeah. don't consciously, but your brain sees it. So that's called entrainment. The brain picks up frequencies and vibrations. So these audio-visual devices use frequencies and vibrations to alter what the brain's doing at a given moment. So, um, I mean, you know, there, I haven't heard of anything detrimental happening to anybody, but I'm, you know, I sort of hold the line that everybody's brain is different, you better make sure you're using the appropriate modality or intervention. What about video games, children's video games? My goodness, I mean, I suppose you could have just as, just as well, you could have positive video games, but right. the video games that are out there are all war-related and violence and killing the bad guy, and I mean, that, I can't imagine that's, not, pro, that's well, not good for kids. It's garbage in, garbage out. You know, it's just that simple. Yeah, but the, does the garbage go out or does it affect them and how they be Well, it goes life? out in behavior. Well, yeah. So that's what I mean. You, you're, there's no doubt that um, violent, in my mind anyway, okay, I know there's going to be um, uh, controversy and studies that they say shows otherwise, but I've been doing this too long and, and watched too many people and children go through um, this, this sort of morbid, a fascination with these war games and video games and killing and all kinds of horrible stuff in there. And you know, you, you see it showing up in their brains. It can't, it cannot not make an impression, in my opinion. So that has to contribute to the violence on the planet then. Well, I mean, especially yeah. these little ones, little, little people that are yeah. doing the it's games. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. Deepak Chopra did come out with a game, though, that was very positive. I can't remember. Wild Divine. Wild Divine, that's right. Wild Divine, right. yeah. That's I good. remember giving it to my son. Yeah. Yeah, and it sat in his closet. <laughs> 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 and he wasn't but sitting in it playing it. No. no. <laughs> he wasn't doing it. <laughs> so um, let's talk again about meditation because yeah. let's say you have someone that has a difficult time meditating. They mm -hmm. just cannot quiet down enough to even sit mm -hmm. and meditate. And a lot of people... I find a lot of my clients have a difficult time meditating. Um, is there a way that you can use neural feedback mm -hmm. to help a person to arrive at that meditative state, at that mm -hmm. place of samadhi, where they're in that deep place of yeah. peace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole hierarchy. Uh, you know, like traditional meditation uh, teachings started with a hierarchy of steps you went through, right? You started with asana or posture, then you went to concentration exercises, you went to breath exercises, and a few more in between, and then finally to what you just mentioned, samadhi. But there was a whole range in between. So when we map somebody's brain, we sort of see where you may need to start first. You may not be ready to go straight there. You may have to start with very simple concentration exercises. Breath work. Some people, I say, go do hatha yoga, the uh, asana yoga, the posture yoga, for a while. Get your body to sort of Calm get down. more flexible and, and more comfortable, then you'll be able to meditate. Mm -hmm. there, there are some people who probably are not ready to jump right into meditation and need right. to do some other things as a prerequisite. And then finally, as things settle down, then they can start to go into the meditation. What about state. using the breath as a catalyst, though? Breath is always number one. Yeah. Your breath and your mind are intimately connected. What your breath is doing, your mind is doing, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So by using breath, which is in almost every meditative tradition I know, you can learn to focus and quiet the mind down. Yeah, yeah. So we're come to the end of our interview. That I just know. flew by. It always does when we're having a great show. Uh, so I, the last question I always like to ask is a pearl of wisdom that you would like to leave our audience with and our audience at home. And there's your camera right there, so you can... Uh, look right into that and tell them whatever what what is a pearl of wisdom or maybe a few mm. that you have 
that you'd like people to leave with today? Well, I think I've said it a few times. The main thing is, is um, pay attention to your brain, pay attention to what you eat, um, how you behave, what you think, uh, what your exercise schedule is, what your lifestyle is like. Uh, change your brain, change your life. I mean, I can't, can't make it any more simple than that. That should be the mantra. And pay attention to what's happening with your brain because it is what is running your life. And it is what it opens you to the deepest parts of yourself, too. So I think that's it. Meditate, <laughs> exercise, Meditate, eat right. exercise. So, yeah. Right, great. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Marty. Thank you. Really. Yeah, thank so, you, Marty. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now it's time, and I can't wait to hear Stu's views around the brain. What have you got? I, we haven't even discussed this, did we? No. We, I, usually we, we, we meet the night before and we talk about what we're going to share with our different quantum, with my quantum quote and with his, Stu's views. But well, one reason why we didn't do that last night is because I had no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> and I was still pacing the floors right before this program here, so I'm asking truly for some divine intervention. <laughs> uh, so, this uh, Stu's views. Uh, remember that movie, The Graduate? They had that famous scene with Dustin Hoffman just having graduated college, and a, uh, one of the, the rich uh, uh, friend of one of, the fa uh, of one of the fathers there comes over. He's like, I got one word for you plastics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know where we're going with this. Yeah. Neuroplastics. That's the word for today. And it really is a blessing that we have this plasticity that we are not just simply a collection of our memories and experiences and even our belief systems, because we are so much more than this. I think all of us, if we were asked the question, look at, my, look at a hand. Do I have a hand or am I my hand? Of course, the answer is I have a hand. So then the next question is, well, who or what is doing the having? So I think we all know that we are so much more than these physical bodies. And this program actually is dedicated to exploring the true nature of our physical reality. That's what consciousness is about, is being aware of what is really going on here on every level, not just the unseen levels, but the actual physical level, which of course a lot of it is unseen, because we don't really see the inside of our brain. We don't see the neural pathways, which ones are working and which ones aren't, and we don't really see those red disks that we may have in various parts of our bodies. What we are knowing is this. We know that reality is far more than what meets the eye. The true nature of our reality really is far beyond what meets the eye. And as Marty just shared with us, our breath is a great place to start. So I'm gonna invite in, I have my own breathing practice that I'd like to share with you because I notice that it's highly reliable that when I do this breathing practice, it does shift how I feel in my body to something that feels more delightful, more expansive, and more connected to something that I think truly is, and I can feel into this, into the intuitive body, is the true nature of our physical reality. And that is, there is something that is all pervasive throughout all of existence. Whether you call it God, spirit, source, unified field of energy, uh, dancing subatomic particles, quantum waves, whatever it is, we appear to be separate when in fact we're all interconnected by that. So on some profound level, it's very possible that whatever that is and whatever we call it is literally doing the living throughout all of us, throughout all of existence, including me and this particular vehicle, whatever we call this, let's call it Stu. And so the breathing exercise that I do is just really simply this. Can I allow for the very real possibility that I'm not the only one, Stu is not only the one doing that breath, that there is something greater that is living through it? And just maybe this entire game of consciousness is simply about remembering who and what we are at the core, which is an aspect of this infinite thing. Because I notice when I do that and just simply breathe, I begin to feel more expansive. I begin to feel a little tingly. And whatever is going on out there isn't really changing, except for the <coughs> fact that my relationship to it does. And to something that feels a lot more accepting and a lot more grateful to be incarnate in this life form, because there are a lot of other life forms out there, may not be so interesting. So there you go. 
<laughs> breathe, mm -hmm. and find your own exercise. And with that, it's time for the quantum quote and Patricia's wisdom. Thank you very much, Stu. My pleasure. That was excellent. So as you can imagine, going online, looking at quotes for the brain, there were thousands of them. And I actually enjoyed myself. I had a great time. I, I took a bunch of screenshots uh, with my iPhone for future reference. But I finally settled on actually two quotes. And one of them, uh, is, a one of them is, an, is an anonymous quote, actually. So I'll just claim it. Uh, here it is. If you cannot stop your mind from constant, unnecessary, incessant thinking, then you are not using your mind. Your mind is using you. Mm. So, uh, I, I really can relate to this statement. Can you relate to the statement? Probably. I call it the monkey mind. It's that it's our mind that's jumping from branch to branch to branch, seldom lighting on a thought and being present. You know, that's what we deal with in this human experience. And it's incredibly challenging because what we want to be doing is becoming present and conscious. So um, how, how can we deal with this? Well, there is an answer. It's meditation. Meditation is the answer. And today, you know, we learned from our special guest, Marty Wetke, that meditation calms the mind. It calms the brain. It brings us to a place of being centered and balanced, where we can actually live a life that's much more productive and much happier. The second quote um, is actually from Deepak Chopra from his book, Super Brain, Unleashing the Explosive Power of the Mind to Maintain Health, Happiness, and Spiritual Well-Being. And he says, the first rule of super brain is that your brain is always eavesdropping on your thoughts. I really like that. And if you teach it about limitation, your brain will be limited. But what if you did the opposite and taught your brain to be unlimited? What do you think? I think if we could eavesdrop on our, on our thoughts and focus on thoughts that are unlimited, focus on thoughts that are our aspirations, our greatest goals, our desires, whatever it is that, that we want to achieve in our lives, that we can do that. And actually, I call that part of the brain, he calls it the super brain, I call it the observer. The observer to me is the silent witness, the watcher watching. It's that aspect of us that can watch ourselves get hooked by an old pattern around something, whatever it would happen to be, relationship, money, sex, anything, and bring us right down into that negative pattern that then runs us like a rat on a wheel. When we become the observer, when we can be eavesdropping on our thoughts and we can pay attention to when we're having a negative thought that's going to bring us into a negative pattern that's going to be the same old, same old, but when we can watch ourselves th thinking that thought, we can change it because then we can be present. We can be present to who we truly are as consciousness because everything is consciousness. So I ask you, what would you rather have, the monkey mind or the observer mind? So there we go. Thank you very much, Stu and Marty. Absolutely. And we're just about ready to close the show now. And when we do that, we didn't, we didn't share this with you, but we're going to take hands, okay. right? And at the count of three, we're going to say, until next time. Until next time. Get, get conscious, conscious now. now. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Melissa Ray of Thrive Beauty Services. I provide transformational beauty services in salon, at home, on site, and at your convenience. I'm proud to be sponsoring Get Conscious Now. My name is Greg Relo. I'm a local attorney and mediator. I'm pleased to be associated with Get Conscious Now. I find the show inspiring. I hope you enjoy the show. Please contact me for help on all your legal matters. I look forward to it. <laughs>